اوکے بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم نحمد و نسلی و نسلم علی رسول الکریم اما بعد ویلکم بیک ٹو ایپیسوڈ ٹویلو وی آر ود اوور ریسپیکٹیڈ گیسٹ روشن محمد صالح ماشاء اللہ ہی از ناٹ این انڈیویجول ہو از ناٹ نون یو ہیو سین ود روشن آن ویریس چینلز اینڈ ویریس ایونیوز اینڈ اسپیشلی آن دا فیمس British Muslim site known as the Five Pillars. Um, just briefly, for, for the viewers who obviously are new to the channel and maybe do not recognize our respected guest, <coughs> I'll just mention uh, briefly about the background of Brother Roshan, inshallah. Brother Roshan, on my left, he's um, been a journalist for approximately 21 years. Um, he's moved around on various channels, alhamdulillah, um, from... working with Al Jazeera to Press TV and now um, and various other organizations and now currently he, he works um, or for, uh, focuses his attention towards uh, five pillars, mashallah, um, and is reported from over, I think we were speaking about this just before we went live as well, over 30 countries, mashallah, um, and he's covered various topics um, and he was there as well um, when the Iraq war broke out um, and mashallah, he's got 20 years of experience under his belt. So this is Brother Roshan, mashallah, and as we all know, I have my partner in, in crime, <laughs> um, Malana Abbas Ab on my right. So without further ado, we want to, inshallah, get into um, the question so that we try and squeeze as much as possible out of you, inshallah, Brother Roshan. Um, <clears throat> I think before we get into the questions, Malana, um, a lot of people who will be seeing yourself, um, you know, the, the, the question would be is that um, if you can just briefly explain your back, background from where you've come from and, um, you know, personal background, personal background, right, inshallah, okay. and then... Well, first of all, as alaykum, 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 thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, pray that your podcast becomes a, a pillar for the ummah and a, a success, inshallah. inshallah. Uh, yeah, so I've got a weird background. I'm, uh, I was born in Sri Lanka. So my, my dad is a Sri Lankan Muslim of Arab descent going back, I would say, three or four generations, Yemen, most likely, although he's not 100% sure himself. Um, he, he passed away, may Allah uh, have mercy on him, uh, about 10 years ago or more. Uh, and my mother is from Wales. So uh, she was a Christian, but she uh, embraced Islam when she married my father. And she went out to Sri Lanka for about 20 years, a bit less than 20 years. Uh, became more Sri Lankan than the Sri Lankans themselves. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was born there, uh, spent my early years there. But I came to back to, you know, the civil war was breaking out in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka at the time. Uh, it became difficult. The, the political and educational environment became quite difficult. So um, my, my mother decided, let's bring the family, me and my two brothers, back to the United Kingdom. So I was probably about five or six years old, uh, maybe even younger than that. And we been, went back to Sri Lanka several times, but my home has basically been uh, Wales and then London uh, when I got married uh, since then. Okay, yeah. subhanAllah. I mean, uh, I think the question for, 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 for Britain would be, do you actually have the British values? That's the main thing. It doesn't matter if you're... <laughs> I don't feel British at all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I never have done. I've always felt an alien in this country. Um, sorry if that shocks you, but I, I, just, I just don't feel British at all. I feel Muslim first and foremost, always have done. Uh, even when I was young, I didn't feel British. Uh, I mean, um, Wales, I'm glad I grew up there, you know, because it's a beautiful place, nice environment. Um, <clears throat> and there was a small Muslim community, so you didn't get the racism that you might get in Birmingham or London or, you know, where there's big Muslim communities. Uh, but at the same time, you're a bit vulnerable because, like, you're the only Muslim there or whatever, you know? But I, it was a nice environment to grow up in. And I don't have anything, even now I sport Wales when it comes to football or rugby, you know, I've got no animosity towards Wales at so, at whatsoever. And even Scotland and places like that where the Muslims actually quite like Scotland. But England, there's an issue in Eng with England yeah. uh, and the way Muslims are treated in England specifically. That's why I would never support England at football. That's why I love it when Argentina beat England on penalties. <laughs> Subhanallah. I think yeah. the British are a bit upset about that, but because yeah, we try to instill British values. <laughs> no, no. I mean, this is, uh, Alhamdulillah, something, Mulana, uh, and we were speaking about this for the podcast, is something I can actually relate to as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like what uh, you just mentioned, like because there was a small 
minority of Muslims in Wales. Mm. Hence, you did not was it you did not face the same level of racism as those who lived in England. I mean, look, I was um, called even though I, I'm half white. Yeah, and a lot of you guys might think I look more white than brown or whatever. In North Wales, when I was growing up, I was the only. Can I say the word? Yeah, yeah. Can I say the word? Of course. I was called Paki every day. Every day I was called Paki. You know. Even by people now who, who think they were my friends, you know, because it was normalized. Racism, this was, a, look, I'm in my late 40s now. This is the 1980s, 1980s, 1990s. Racism was completely normalized then. And, um, <clears throat> and at least growing up in Birmingham, you got your mates to back you up there. I didn't have any mates. I was like the only P in the town, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I know what racism is. Despite the color of my skin, you know, which is lighter than yours, I know what racism is because I suffered it every day growing up in that environment. At the same time, it wasn't like a vicious, it wasn't a physical racism. Like I was never, you know, beaten up, but I was called those words every day and made to feel inferior every day. And I think that's why I developed a bit of a, a chip on my shoulder, to, to be honest, <laughs> which I still have today. Manana, subhanallah. <clears throat> yeah. You know, it's amazing that Brother Roshan mentions this. Uh, last week we had uh, Brother Mozambique he was actually speaking about the same thing. Mm. And now, obviously, the question that comes to my mind, like, subhanAllah, and this is a journey I'm trying to, uh, what you call it, a journey I'm on. And obviously, you being a person of more years and more, ex more experience, could you say these earlier years is what shaped Roshan Saleh? I think it's the, the case for all of us. Yeah, those, like, formative experiences of racism, Islamophobia, um, and it's, only got, it's, it's got better and worse at the same time. Let me explain that. So racism is less overt now because they can't be because we fought for our rights. They, they didn't hand, hand us those rights because at the goodness of their heart, we fought for them. We fought for those rights that we have today not to be racially abused in the open like was so common in the 80s and the 90s. But the way it's got worse is I think there's more Islamophobia now. In, in my day, people didn't know anything about Islam. So they couldn't really be Islamophobic because they're so ignorant. Now there's like a campaign against Islam. Um, at the same time, Islam is stronger, alhamdulillah, especially British Muslims. You know, we have become stronger as a community. And unlike American Muslims, which I, who I have to say they're sold out, <laughs> they're sold out to LGBT, they're sold out to, uh, you know, the liberal agenda. Whereas British Muslims, we've... We are unique in many ways. Like I lived in France as well. I lived in France for, for a couple of years. Okay. And the French Muslim community, they've sold out as well in many ways. And, the, and they descended into criminality, large sections of them. Whereas we, out of all the diaspora communities in the world, we are the strongest. And, and European, other European Muslims, they realize that they look towards British Muslims as a model. And so do the Americans in many ways. The ones that like, are practicing, I mean. Um, yeah, we've held on to the rope of, of Islam stronger than anyone else, I think. Uh, which is unusual because, because what usually happens when communities emigrate to another country is they assimilate over generations. We have, and that's what the British counted on, on happening to us, but it hasn't happened. It happened with the Hindus. It happened with the Sikhs. It happened with the, uh, the, the, the West Indians. But the Muslims were getting stronger in our Islam. Alhamdulillah. You know, and that is a problem for the majority community because we haven't watered down our faith. In fact, it's gone the opposite way. What would you say about those people who actually, you know, they've, and I've met personally as well, certain people who will come out and say, brother, you don't know, this country's done so much for Muslims. This mm. country's done, uh, you know, they've... they've what, uh, killed them in Iraq and Afghanistan? And, uh, well, uh, what's they, it done? they come out with this claim that, you know what, um, if we compare the, the British Muslims, uh, the standard of living and how they, they are treated in, in, in the UK yeah. uh, to Middle Eastern countries, or mm. even, you know, you know the argument. They'll, they'll come up with that. What, what? Look, I've I've been to so many Muslim countries. I don't glorify the Muslim world. I know there's so many problems in the Muslim world, and uh, the the level of repression in some countries is much worse than here. Yeah, we do have certain freedoms, but I don't think we should be comparing ourselves to Muslims in the Muslim world. We should be comparing themselves to non-Muslims in this country because we're citizens. We're not we're not we're not guests in this country. We are citizens with the same rights as any white non-Muslim, black non-Muslim, whatever. That's who we should be comparing ourselves to. And compared to them, we are second class citizens in this country. And that ain't on. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's that's a very good point that uh, Brother Roshan mentioned. Because because what it is is to, you know, through the legislation, the 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 laws, and you know, through the um through through the the you could say the the secretive 
behavior of of the government, especially in the UK as well, how they've dealt with Muslims. Um, you know, we we've we've been we've not only uh, been treated like second class citizens, but we've made be feel in that way as well. It's written into law. It's pre <laughs> prevent. You know, the counter ex uh, yeah, terrorism yeah. extremism strategy basically is a monitoring and spying operation on Muslims and all our kids are in schools and they're being basically referred to counter-terrorism police officers if they support Palestine or if they say something against LGBT. Now, we are being treated differently to any other community. That means we're second-class citizens and that is in law. And that's not to mention the Islamophobia we suffer, you know, through the media, through politics, our countries being invaded, you know, our religion being attacked, uh, our prophet being attacked, uh, peace be upon him. Um, you know, it's like, um, it's open season on, on Muslims, quite frankly, and we're, we're not treated the same as other citizens of this country. And I think a lot of, a lot of us are, 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 and it's getting worse by the way, yeah. and a lot of um, British Muslims, if they think they can just live comfortable lives here, you know, for the rest of their lives, have a nice car, nice job, nice house, chill out on the weekends, whatever, they're in for a rude awakening because the price of that is you give up your Islam. Yeah, okay. If you if you if you uh, become a liberal Muslim, all you care about is fasting during Ramadan, praying a few times in the mosque, whatever. That's fine. They won't touch you. But as soon as you start living by Islam, you know, and you know, enjoying the good, forbidding the evil, you're in trouble. You are in big trouble. And the space for Muslim activism is shrinking in this country. It's only going to get worse. We're going to go. We're going down the route of France. You know, where basically mosques are being shut for no reason because they call the uh, they call they call the uh, the government racist. That's why mosques are being shut in France. The biggest the biggest Islamophobia organization was shut down in France because they call French state racist. <laughs> the biggest Muslim charity was shut down for the same reason in France. That is that we're about twenty years behind France. And who knows? I say this all the time, and everyone laughs at me. I reckon we're fifty years behind China whereby politically active Muslims are going to be put into re-education camps. You know, that's the trajectory. And I, I see that because I have this historical view of being older than you guys. Yeah, um, this, is, this is the route we are going down unless we stop it from happening. I mean, you know, uh, coming on for, from the point that you mentioned uh, previously that <clears throat> we fought for our rights. Mm. Um, what would you say about those people who, let's say, just say, look, let's just seclude ourselves in our masjids, in our organizations, um, carry on doing our, um, I mean, I don't even need to get an answer from you, from your gesture that you just your, your facial but, yeah. I mean, for me, I'm not an island, but for yeah, me, yeah. that's not Islam, right? We, yeah. we have to, of course, um, we have an inner life and an outer life, right? And we must take care of both. You know, we're not, we're not monks like the Christians, you know, uh, locking ourselves away. Uh, of course, we should do that. And First and foremost, we're accountable to, for ourselves and when we meet our maker and therefore our inner spiritual life is the most important thing. I, I sincerely believe that. Even as a Muslim activist, I think that, you know, the first thing I think of is, is what kind of Muslim am I? And the, and the answer is a very imperfect Muslim. But I try to be as, because I know that I've got a position of responsibility. Yeah, of course. You know, so I have to be the best Muslim I can possibly be. Have I reached that level? No way. You know, no way. I'm not going to start telling you all my sins here in public. But, but you know, we also have to have a public life. We have to give dawah. Yes. Why are we here? There's a lot of there's a lot of ulama that I've consulted who say that we can't even be in this country, a non-Muslim country that rules by kufr, unless we're giving dawah to the non-Muslims. So I'm I'm kind of doing that. I've got an excuse, uh, you know, because five pillars is very public facing. Non-Muslims read it. What is the excuse of those Muslims in this country that are not giving dawah and the only, you know, the only thing they're doing is getting bigger houses and bigger cars and, and more money and, you know, kind of, um, you know, indulging in the dunya. I don't know. Uh, just subhanallah, <coughs> Brother Roshan, like there's a verse that come to my mind. A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajim walladhina jahadu fina lanahdiyannahum subulana. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the path that leads to God. God uses the word subul. Now you have some affiliation yes. with the Arabic language, Mulana's affiliation. Now there's a difference between sabil and subul. Sabil is a singular for a path and subul is the plural for that. So subhanAllah, like the journalism you're doing now, obviously we've got young listeners, uh, our students listening. Sometimes people want to do this work uh, for the sake of deen. 
and not everyone can become an imam not everyone can mm. become uh, a hifz teacher a alim course teacher a teacher in darul ulum some people their expertise lies uh, lie elsewhere uh, and since uh, alhamdulillah we did meet up on the lady of heaven mm, as well yeah, yeah. since then alhamdulillah like i said and i've sat here with the paper and pen today and i told alhamdulillah you know i could learn from the experience and the knowledge of brother roshan inshallah but from then my mind actually opened first as as a teacher myself and i've actually told my students now and mashallah there's some of them who have completed their hives and academically mashallah you know their top sets for their math science english yeah. and i've actually put this uh, journalism as an option for them to pursue mm. in the future so this is a message like alhamdulillah the people what they tend to think is when it comes to deen <coughs> deen is only restricted to the masajid as 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 mulana skandar has mentioned or deen is only for the ulama and like you said uh, commanding good and forbidding evil evil this brings us to the verse of kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhauna 'anil munkar so it's a, a responsibility on each and everybody's shoulders um and alhamdulillah I was uh, speaking to a brother yesterday and a brother today as well um and when when obviously when we're doing this podcast I try and take some models and lessons out for our, especially our, our young listeners out there uh, who due to living under such a mess are facing things like mental health and <clears throat> many many issues so it's important for un- for us to understand that our deen does not lie only in the masajid islam it means submission and this submission it's a way of life we have to go out there and like you said subhanallah like people are just there the houses are getting bigger the plates are getting bigger the bellies are getting bigger you know uh, the the walls getting increased but subhanallah when it comes to attention and it comes to deen uh, brother roshan i'm sure from your experience as well you know you could i think we got i mean i'm not sure whether i should say this or not but i mean just obviously, say it with the same robson robson going through a cost of living crisis at the moment right and every muslim organization has noticed a drop off uh in their donations because whether it's a mosque a charity five pillars whatever and sometimes i think is this justified because if you think about it people are canceling donations of 5 pound a month all right that's two coffees at starbucks that's one coffee at starbucks subhanallah a month are they what i want to know is are they giving up those coffees <laughs> are they giving up are they giving up that gym membership are they giving up the the frivolous stuff you know the the the, the, the takeaways the takeaways i decided cuz you know i'm feeling the pinch like everyone else i said right i'm not going to buy any takeaways for myself and my family just one a week maybe one a week i'm already saving that 200 quid a month so hard on so what is the excuse of people not to give 5 pounds to a masjid or to an islamic home? there is no baraka in a costa coffee or a Starbucks coffee that is baraka in islamic donations we need to support our communities i'm not just making a pitch for five pillars here but all yeah. muslim institutions we need to support our own institutions with our cash and if that means given up some of these frivolities give them up seriously kfc mcdonalds you're going to you're you're not going to give that up but you're going to give up an islamic donation i mean shame on you absolute shame on you anyway Well I'm so sure. just cast all my donors now but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know like 100% well, no, yeah, I like 100% I agree with you subhanallah is a cost of living crisis and we see subhanallah when it comes to starbucks it comes to costa it comes to pleasing ourselves and we as muslims we need to understand the blessings of giving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah. there's many many verses mulana uh, when it comes to the verse of surah al-baqarah mathal alladhina yunfiquna amalan fi sabili Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an example and how us giving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it only increases us in our wealth in our blessings exactly. in our livelihood in our satisfaction so alhamdulillah uh, we'll, we'll move on from that mulana yeah uh, come back on to journalism you mentioned because we want to try and tackle inshallah the stage by stage um what would you say um oh this is a question for yourself i think this will be very beneficial as well for those who are probably on um, you know on the media platform or using social media to promote and um you know engage with the non muslims um what's your view on um uh, going on to a pre-recorded uh, show or on a live show mm. and defending um islamic principles or values on the is mainstream a, media yeah on the mainstream media is it a good idea obviously you've got 20 years experience Mark. i've done it a few times I, mean, i was on news night about six months ago yeah. during the lady of heaven uh yeah. I, i watched that yeah yeah. Watched that, yeah and that was the first time i'd been on the bbc in about three years because they I, i'm convinced they have a blacklist i reckon i'm this is the first time i'm saying this in public by the way yeah um and one day i'm pretty sure i'm going to be proved right with a freedom of information request or something i reckon prevents 
and uh, maybe people like Majid Nawaz, Sara Khan, the ex counter extremism czar, they have sent a memo to the mainstream media stay away from these groups. Because it's not just five pillars, me, myself and Dilly, that aren't invited onto the mainstream media anymore. It's uh, people like Moaz and Beg, who's our senior and probably maybe even the most prominent British Muslim there is, yeah. the most famous British Muslim, Moaz and Beg. When was the last time you saw him on Sky or BBC? It's a very long time ago. Um, and so many of us are, are suffering the same kind of blackout from the mainstream media. Now, I don't know how I got into Newsnight six months ago. I think it must have been a young junior researcher, researcher who hadn't got the memo, basically. So I slipped through the net and uh, I got on Newsnight. So, and, so he's in his diapers, I think. Yeah, yeah. He must have got sacked straight after. Yeah. But anyway, what I would say is that do not trust the mainstream media. They are the biggest vehicle for Islamophobia in the world, quite frankly. They were the ones that, that beat the drums for war in Iraq, Afghanistan. They laid, public, they laid the ground for public opinion. They laid the ground for public opinion to accept all these restrictions on Muslims, okay? Yeah. So do not, they are not on your side. They are there to target you. If you get the chance to go on, I would go live. I wouldn't go pre-record. Yeah. If you go pre-record, they'll edit you, they'll edit, all the good stuff you say, it's and they'll use 10 seconds of it, you know, and it might make you, make you look bad, or it might give a little bit of balance to their already biased report, you know? Because yeah. they need a little bit of balance there so that they're not complete propaganda, you know? Um, the best thing to do is to go live, and not on Skype even, go to the studio, because they can't cut you off. I've been on Skype, even that Newsnight appearance, I was on Skype, and they cut me off a few times. All right. And I couldn't finish my sentence. And um, if you're in the studio, you can nail them. <laughs> because if you think about it, if you think about it, we should be quite confident because not only do we speak their language better than them, not only do we know their culture as good as them, we know our culture too and our religion and we know the issues better than them. So when we are put up against them, we should win that debate hands down. The only they, way they can win is if they cut you off or if they um, basically get like three against one or something and don't let you talk. So my, my, when, when somebody invites me onto mainstream media, I say, all right, who's on with me? Um, if I know it's three against one, I won't go on. I say, oh, it's a lynch mob. This is the lynch, yeah. lynching. If they cut me off, I'll say, why are you being rude? You know, I've, I've got these little techniques. I'll, I'll go, I did you the courtesy of being quiet when you spoke. Why are you being rude to me? Is it because I'm a Muslim? You know, something like that, and that shuts them up straight away because they've got this British sense of fair play or we must have fair play, you know? So there's little tricks you can use, but unfortunately, a lot of Muslims, they only get the kind of Muslims who are sellouts, coconuts, native informants. That's the kind of Muslim that goes in the mainstream media now, right? Yeah. Or, and the, the good ones are often lynched because they think what they're going to be treated fairly. They're, they're under this illusion that they're going to be, oh, it's British fair play. Come <laughs> on, man. They are going to lynch you. If they can, they're going to make you look so bad and spread it everywhere. So it can be quite daunting, you know, but prepare, know what you're talking about, have something on the interviewer. I was interviewed by Andrew Neil once on the BBC. Do you know Andrew Neil? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. And, um, and he didn't say anything bad to me, but I had stuff on him that I was going to say in case he came to me. I was going to talk about the um, the call girl that he went out with 20 years previously. And like, like literally, you know, and Piers Morgan. I was going to go on Piers Morgan once, but it didn't, it didn't happen. They canceled me at the last minute. And I was going to talk about him uh, phone hacking and whatever. All this kind of stuff was in my head just in case they came at me. Because if they come at you, you go back at them. Yeah, subhanAllah. <laughs> uh, talking about phone hacking, well, I'm going to put it in now. Um, I know you've mentioned quite a few times uh, previously as well that your phone's been hacked. Um, I mean, for the views as well, especially, I mean, uh, this is my opinion, I think, because obviously previously you worked for Al Jazeera as well. Yeah. And I don't know, obviously, if you've uh, read up that report on Pegasus. Of course. It happens all the time. <laughs> so, I mean... Occupational so hazard. If you are a Muslim activist in this country and you have any prominence whatsoever, you're going to get your phone hacked. Uh, because they can't, they can't take you on with the debates because they don't have legs to stand on. We will beat them in open argument. So what they'll try and do is they will uh, try and target your family. They will try and target, uh, get personal. So they shut you up that way. And they use the dirtiest tricks in the book. And obviously we know the Israelis have done this. We know that the government of the UAE has done this. Uh, and the British do it all the time, of course, as well. Every Muslim activist, prominent Muslim activist, you ask Muazzam, they, they bugged his car, I think. Uh, and that came out during the, the trial. So this is all on public record. 
uh, they bugged his car for a year. They put some kind of listening device in there. Um, yeah, you ask any prominent Muslim activist, have you had your phone hacked? Have you had some kind of surveillance? Um, they will say yes. However, it's very difficult to prove. So people will think we're crazy. Oh, you're paranoid, you're crazy. But I can say hand on heart here, you know, uh, I swear by Allah, this has happened to me. It's happened to so many Muslim activists. And that's, um, that's the price you pay for being a Muslim activist in this country. Now, I'm personally willing to pay that price, but I must admit it can be hard on your loved ones and stuff like that. So what kind yeah. of stuff, what kind of stuff as in? I don't particularly want to go into okay. it, to be honest, because some of it is, is not for public it's consumption. Public and some of it is, is probably going to be um, the subject of a lawsuit as well. Okay. So, um, but yeah, your, your, um, your, your phone will get hacked. Yeah. And not only that, you'll get funny phone calls in the middle of the night. Um, and you will get, um, the, the, this hasn't happened to me as, according to my knowledge, but you'll get people coming to your house, uh, breaking into your house, really not there, rearranging the furniture so that you think you're crazy. So it's all a kind of, um, mind game. This is all techniques, um, used by intelligence services to basically, you know, mess with your, your brain so that you, you begin to doubt yourself, you doubt your own, own sanity because they, if they can't get you publicly, and on the arguments, or if you're not a criminal or a terrorist or whatever, then they have to stop you somehow because you're winning the argument. Yeah. So this is this is what they do. Well, this brings me back to a, a verse of the Quran in the 28th Jews. يَبُسُطُوا إِلَيْكُمْ أَيْدِيَهُمْ وَأَلْسِنَتَهُمْ بِالسُّوءِ Like you mentioned, subhanAllah, if they can't get you verbally, Allah subhanahu wa mentions two things in these verses, that they'll spread out towards you, أَيْدِيَهُمْ, that their hands I talk about this rearranging that they're doing in your homes. Mm. Uh, this is the mainstream media, Mulana. What they're doing is they're using the mainstream media to portray Muslims in this light. Allahu Akbar. What's the end result of this? This is why we as British Muslims, Allahu Akbar, we need to be more strong in our faith. The end result from these people is they want us to disbelieve. Mm. On a lighter note, just for the boys here, they might be thinking as well, that's it. Don't worry, brothers, uh, you know your phones, the spam calls you get from Alam Rock and Birmingham. It's, a, it's the same stuff. Uh, just good this is, it's, a, it's a tracking device. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. I mean, um, I mean, that's how they got um, all these uh, Al-Qaeda guys. That's how they got them. They made phone calls, you know, and um, it's a tracking device. And uh, if you don't understand that, I mean, if you're a nobody and... No one cares about you. You'll be fine. But as soon as you come on the radar and you get a bit of notoriety and, and even, I remember when Five Pillars was just starting, the authorities didn't care about us then because mm. we didn't, we were a very small audience and whatever. But when we started getting 100,000 people on Facebook, 200,000, 300,000, five, we got over half a million now. Not and then sure. we started getting, you know, then it started, then we started noticing the shadow bands and the violations and the restricting our reach on social media. Um, and um, we know all this is happening. And this, that's what the Brits are like. They don't come at you. Like the Americans, they come at you. In, in a way, I respect them a little bit more because they just they just shut you down and they, they come at you no, that reason, like yeah. straight straight in your face, we're going to do this. The Brits, they, they smile to your face and they stab you behind your back. I mean, it's like that policy uh, the American police have killed first and then ask questions later. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, for, for the audience as well, I mean, um, look, Brother Roshan, uh, Roshan, you'll agree with this as well. I mean, um, end of the day, realistically, um, this shouldn't obviously discourage us in what we're doing. We should be brave. Um, we should remain firm on our principles. I mean, if you look at through the Sira, through the Quran as well, um, and even in this day and age, like Brother Mozam we had um, on last week, perfect example. I mean, um, he's innocent, no charges against him. If they really wanted to uh, throw us in prison or, you know, on false charges or any, they can't really do that. I mean, there's always that, mm, that avenue. Easy. So, so um, we shouldn't be living in fear thinking, okay, if I stay away from this or stay, end of the day, if they really want to, they can imprison us for 20, 30 years or even, you know, pick us up. I mean, I know one of the brothers mentioning, I don't want to mention the name of the organization. He was saying that he had a private dialogue with that, with, with that entity. And they said, listen, we can pick you up from your house and ship you off somewhere. No one would know where you are. 
and I, you know, and he said, "Go and do it." Let's see what happens. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, if they really want to do it, they can do it. I mean, let's be real. But at the end of the day, they I can think invent we, something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But we just got to carry on doing what we're doing, and remember at the back, uh, at uh, the back of our hearts and minds that it's Allah who is the most powerful, and Allah will protect us. Look, and, you know, the way I look at it is that you know when uh, in the Quran it says, you know. Or the hadith, I forget the hadith about the day of judgment. No one knows when the, the hour is. Yeah. But our own personal hour is not far away, is it? Our own personal death yeah. is just around the corner. Um, what are we going to say to our creator if we sold out, if we, if we lived in fear? You know, I know it's not for everyone. Not everyone has to do it. Not everyone has to be public facing like Moaz and Beg. You know, not everyone has to, and that's an extreme case where he's literally walked the walk. You know, he's been in jail several times, three years in Guantanamo, one year in Belmarsh. All right, that's not going to happen to to most, no matter how open an activist you are. But, you know, there is a contribution we can all make to the Dawa, um, to solidifying our community, to building our institutions. And it doesn't have to be public facing all the time. You don't always have to take the heat. So, but at the same time, we do need to be brave and courageous and if we're not brave and courageous, then we just have to look at our role models. You know, the the, the Prophet Wasallam, the Sahaba, our, our great historical figures like Salahuddin. I mean, even Salahuddin, for example, I was reading about Salahuddin. And, you know, Allah has, has raised his station to be amongst the highest in the Ummah. But he wasn't a particularly great Muslim before. I mean, I've heard... And I think this is true. I'm not, I don't, I don't, uh, put it this way. He, you know, he indulged in some bad things uh, before he became the great Salah Adin we know. So there's hope for all of us. Even, yes. even those that are sinners, you know, Allah is, is, is the receptor of repentance, the, the merciful, the beneficent. And I think that we have to be brave. I and mean, too many of us are not brave. We're, we're cowardly in our outlook. And, and if, if we, if, Every, after everything they've done to us, invaded our countries on false pretexts, killed our people, you know, the racism, the Islamophobia, prevent all that kind of stuff. If we still think the best of the non-Muslims in this country, yeah. I mean, I just see them as potential Muslims. You know, that's like, uh, you know, I, I see a pub as a future mosque. That's what that's what I'm here to do, you know, not to keep this country, not to be a minority in this country, in a non-Muslim majority country. I want this country to become Muslim, obviously through a process of dawah and not through violence or anything like that. Course, yeah. There's always a disclaimer, isn't there? Because <laughs> like, we must be inherently like got gun here, so, yeah. But um, but yeah, if that, what's our ambition? I think you know, is it is it for the dunya? Did our parents come here for the dunya? Did they? Sometimes I think they did. And we're just continuing that tradition. What's the point of being here mm. if it's just for the dunya? Because that's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is for the akhirah. Yeah, subhanAllah. <laughs> MashaAllah is, uh, like you mentioned a few points. One was obviously, uh, I just wanted to add, like when your following start growing uh, and they started to shadow ban you, mm. uh, this took me directly to the story of uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So when he started growing in popularity, now they say, subhanAllah, history regurgitates itself. In the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, when he's coming with this message now, and that era, you see the Jews go to the Romans, and what they're trying to do is, you know, shadow ban Isa alayhi salatu wasalam from his message. Yeah. So alhamdulillah, and he was growing in popularity. So it's like you've mentioned, for us to obviously overcome that, you've mentioned obviously there's a fear factor here, Mulana. we know that there's a fear factor. <clears throat> People have this fear factor, and we need to overcome this fear factor. And it's uh, the leaders that need to take it, brother. Sorry yes. to cut you off. Sorry. No, 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 but obviously we can't expect the average person in the street to, to be a leader, but there are leaders in this community and they're not brave enough. And, um, you know, they're the ones, we need a community led by lions, not mice, you know, and um, at the moment we've got too many mice leading our community. And what good have they done? You know, I mean, if we, if we follow them, we're going to lose our Islam a couple of generations down the line. Even now on the hijab, yeah, I was having a discussion earlier on, we're kind of, um, you know, we're, we're becoming more accepting of un-Islamic stuff, even within our own community. And I think the hijab is a good, I don't know, you're the, you're the ulama here, so maybe you tell me if I'm wrong. I think the hijab is a good example of that. Um, obviously, it's an obligation in Islam on our sisters. Half our sisters do not wear the hijab, I would say, in this country. We all have family members who don't wear the hijab and, you know, despite our best efforts, whatever. But we have become tolerant of that. 
Now, obviously, that's half the ummah. We, cannot, we cannot reject our sisters who do not wear hijab, but we can't be accepting of it either because ultimately that's going around every day defying Allah, isn't it? In the most blatant way. I mean, thank God for the, for the men, the burden is less, you know. We don't have to cover our heads. Mm. We're tested in other ways. Um, and I know we're all sinners, and especially behind closed doors where we're all sinners, but when we go into the public space, at least we have to give a good impression and, and try and live as, as Muslims. And half our sisters are not doing that. Mm. And I know men are our biggest sinners than sisters in many ways. Uh, and, you know, I certainly know more good women than I know, know men, you know, because I know men really well. So I know what we're like. But when we're, we've just become too accepting of haram. And I don't want to go down that route. We've got to, we've got to stick to normative orthodox Islam because if we don't, it's going to be taken away from us in a blink of an eye. You know, you're saying, <clears throat> so, you know, coming off what you've just mentioned, what, what would your opinion be, especially from your experience? Because, I mean, um, a person with experience will have much more knowledge compared to a person who's just um, doing a daily routine in that kind of sense. Um, or especially if his, his vision is blurred in the sense mm -hmm. that um, he doesn't get to see or view other societies, other communities, get to see the other side of the world. Obviously, you visited, Marshall over 30 countries. And uh, before I mentioned this as well, just for the, for the viewers, inshallah, is that um, this is one of the... 30 Muslim countries. I've actually visited 45 countries. <laughs> oh, mashallah, yeah. 30 Muslim countries, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, obviously, this is why, one of the reasons why we wanted to have this podcast was to to uh, bring more light upon Five Pillars, which is doing a yeah. fantastic job, mashallah. Um, Allah bless you, brothers, and increase you in more barakah, inshallah. Amen. Amen. Um, so, the question would be, is, Brother Roshan, is what, what's your take that, okay, maybe next 5, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, um, we were talking about this before we went on live as well. Um, do you think uh, hijrah would become uh, obligatory, or you know? I think those. Angle? I think those people who can make hijrah should do it. Um, even try it out for a few years. I mean, I know lots of uh, Pakistanis go home, and Bangladeshis they go home for a few years, and they come back, which is fine, you know. But I think. Um, if you have the means to do it, I know not everyone can do it because maybe they have financial family commitments here. Maybe they have sick parents or whatever. So not all of us can do it. Um, I personally follow the position that you cannot be in this country unless you're, you're doing dawah. That's the position that I follow. Um, and I know that not everyone can leave for whatever reasons, legitimate reasons, even if they want to. But if you have the opportunity, yeah, go and live in, even if you want to live in the Middle East. I mean, I, the Khalij is not a, a place that I'm a great fan of, but for westernized Muslims, people, Muslims that are living in the West, it's an easy place, you know, because you can get by on English, you have your coffee shops, your shopping malls, and it's like a halfway house between the Islamic world and the Western world. Uh, somewhere like Turkey might be a bit like that as well. Afghanistan, we might get onto that. That's definitely not for you. Because <laughs> that, that ain't an easy place to live, although I love it. But, um, but um, yeah, if you have the opportunity, Malaysia is another place a lot of Muslims are going to. Um, if you're a bit tougher and you don't need the mod cons of modern life, then maybe you could go like to... Uh, you know, Northwest Frontier Province or something like that, or, uh, or uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I would say, I would say do Hijra, just because I think it's good to be, when I go on holiday, I try to go to a Muslim country, always, just to keep myself in that atmosphere, you know, and to kind of boost my own Iman and the Iman of my, of my family, you know. I think we should, because we're part of the Ummah, the Ummah's one body, so we should always strive, do not go to like, uh, I don't know, France or whatever, or, you know, these countries on holiday, Spain. I mean, Sp I, Spain, I, I went to Spain because I like the, yeah, the yeah. south of Spain is, is like, an, you know, it yeah. was, it was uh, an Islamic place. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you can't go on Hijra, then at least if you go on a holiday, choose a Muslim country, Morocco, you know, places like that. Okay. Out of the 30 Muslim countries, um, the best in in terms of and the worst following yeah. <laughs> <laughs> following the Sharia and the worst in terms the of Sharia. following the Sharia. Um, all right, so you'd expect me to say Afghanistan, but I'm actually going to say Yemen. Um, I spent about a month in Yemen learning Arabic. This is a while ago, so about ten years ago, and it was like literally stepping back in time into like the time of Rasulullah or something like that. You know, uh, just the atmosphere and all the women went around in the cub and all the. Uh, 
uh, just the manners of them. They were such beautiful people, but if you cross them, they just kill you, <laughs> you know, because they have these hunches, you know, these <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. daggers. And yeah, yeah the, the, if you insult them, they just kill you, literally. But but otherwise, the most beautiful people in the world. And it just it just it felt like a place that was unspoiled by the modern world. Uh, that was before the war. I went. So now, who knows? Obviously, that it's gone through a, a, a tough period. Um, Gaza. I love Gaza as well. I was only there for about four days. Uh, but the, what the, year was that when you went? Uh, I went ju- after the Egyptian Revolution because oh. it was opening up. It was yeah. a, a work assignment, uh, and despite everything, despite all the hardships those people go through—the bombing, the you know—it's open. It's open air prison, Gaza. Um, the people were so sweet. And I remember two incidents. Can, I, can yeah. I elaborate a little of bit course, here? Of course, of course. Two incidents happened when I was in Gaza. Um, the Hamas, basically, I mean, Hamas are a prescribed, you know, just recently yeah. terror organization in the UK, yeah. but they are the authority in, in Gaza. So when I was there, they were taking us around everywhere. And they took us to where Sheikh Ahmed Yassin was assassinated by the Israelis, the drone strike. They took us to a tent because people were living, this was shortly after Israel had invaded and everyone was living in tents because they'd lost their houses. And the lady in the tent, in front of the uh, authorities, the local authorities, were criticizing them. Why are we still in the tent after one year? And I thought, wow, you know, isn't she scared? She should be scared of their reaction. And she wasn't. She wasn't scared of that. And that's kind of telling. Another incident was... <clears throat> the Hamas authority, they were, um, uh, there was a foreign office car. We were, we were traveling in it and they cut a red light. And the policeman, the ordinary, you know, shurti, basically, police guy, he stopped the vehicle and he, he berated the driver who was in a foreign ministry car with officials inside. And I thought, wow, I didn't expect that because in Pakistan, that would never happen. In, yeah, yeah. in Egypt, that would never happen. That shruti would be dead now, you know? So those were two surprising incidents that happened in, in Gaza. And the people were just lovely. And it's a beautiful place, beautiful beach. It would be a tourist destination if it wasn't, you know, yeah. kind of um, besieged. Um, and we can talk about Afghanistan later, maybe. Uh, that would be one of the places as well. Uh, the worst is definitely in the Khalij because they have been sport by money. Um, too much money is a bad thing, you know, and these are people that had nothing 60 years ago. And then they, they're like lottery winners who used to live in council estates and now they live in mansions, you know, and, um, and it goes to their head all this, and they go through the hundred million in about two years because it's gone to their heads and they're, <laughs> oh, I must have the tallest building, the tallest, the biggest football tournament, you know, and they waste their money. They could be solving the Ummah's issues with this money, you know? Uh, but the Khalij, obviously, I'm not talking about individuals here, but as a state, and obviously we know they're nor- normalizing with Israel, they're trying to water down Islam, they're liberalizing Islam, all the scholars are in jail, the uh, Sheikh Salman al Auda, all these prominent scholars, they're in jail now. So what is happening in the Khalij now, uh, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, and the UAE, who are the spear leaders uh, of all this, um, is, is shameful. And that's why I personally uh, would not go and live in the UAE um, or Saudi Arabia or Bahrain, simply because these guys are traitors. They have normalized with the Zionist entity of Israel that is oppressing our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And for me, that isn't because let's face it, brothers and sisters, when we talk about the millions dead in Iraq, when we talk about the massacres in Gaza, For most British Muslims or Muslims around the world, it isn't actually real. I've been to Iraq. I've I've seen dead bodies. I've been to Gaza. I've seen the dead. I've smelled the stench of death. Mm. So for me, it's personal. Of course. It's really personal. And I will never forgive MBS, MBZ, the ruler of Bahrain for the treachery that they've done and the way they've sold out the Palestinians over these last few years. Subhanallah. There's a lot of information to take from that. Subhanallah. Um, Obviously, Mulana, we were just talking about uh, the fear factor and then we moved on from that. It just goes to show care, uh, like you mentioned two things, the purpose of staying in a place like Britain, you either do for one of two reasons. Uh, sorry, you got two options, basically. One is either you stay here for dawah purposes or you do hijrah. 
And then obviously you've mentioned the, the countries, mashallah, which you favored over the other Muslim countries. For, let's say, our uh, uh, audience or our young audience, if they had an opportunity now, for example, and they wanted to stay here for dawa purposes, first and foremost, what you what brought you into journalism? And if someone okay. does want to come into journalism right. and play the role that you, you're playing, inshallah, what steps and what guidance could you go? Okay, to? so the reason I was a teacher for a few years, um, because I didn't great, get that great ga- grades in university and I kind of, I didn't ever want to do teaching. I fell into it because I was a lazy student and um, I did it for two years. I hated it. It just wasn't for me. I didn't want to be in one building for the rest of my life. Um, the, it, was, it was an inner city school in Blackpool and the pupils weren't that nice and the, the, my colleagues were like brain dead and <laughs> kind of people that went on holidays and read like Jeffrey Archer books on the beach and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and I just had nothing in common with them, you know? And I was like, I was like this young Muslim teacher that believed in Khilafah and like, you know, and I, what did I have in common with these people? And um, yeah, so I stopped teaching uh, and I retrained as a journalist. The reason why I, I, I wanted to do journalism is because I love to read, I love to write, uh, I love to travel, meet interesting people. So that's why I thought it could be a vehicle to do that kind of stuff and make a bit of money as well. So, um, um, yeah, that's how I got into teaching. Would I encourage others to go into, uh, sorry, uh, journalism? Would I encourage, uh, I've had a great career um, in terms of a really enjoyable career. You spend so much of your life working that you have to enjoy what you're doing. If you're in a, you know, a kind of a job that you hate, even if you're getting paid 100 grand a year, it's not going to be worth it because you're spending so much time at work. We spend more time at work than we spend with our families, you know? So you have to enjoy it at least a little bit. And I thought, I want to do a job that I enjoy. And therefore, yeah, for the past like 25 years, it's been more than 21 years, but 25 years now that I've been a journalist. Um, I've, uh, for the mo- not every single moment, but for the most part, you know, I've traveled the world. I've met heads of state, interviewed heads of state. I've interviewed so many people that have been killed in unnatural circumstances I've interviewed. That's not a great claim to fame, but, you know, it's amazing the amount. I mean, I, I mean, it might be a bad idea for you guys to interview me. Do you know what I mean? Or be interviewed by me. What's going to happen to you guys? You know, like tomorrow. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but yeah, but seriously, I'm scared of <laughs> like literally about 20 people that I've interviewed have met unnatural deaths. Do you want to just cut this into your show? I now? think that's it. We're wrapping up. <laughs> Boys, take it off the live and delete the video. <laughs> nah, nah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. We're, we're ready, inshallah. We're, we're, ready. we're looking for excuses to give our life for the sake of Allah, inshallah. So, so I've had a good inshallah. time. I've had a good time, alhamdulillah. And a uh, really enjoyable time. And I feel that I've done some good along the way. And I've probably made lo- loads of mistakes as well. Uh, I would encourage Muslims, because ultimately, if you want to give dawah, you got to. it's about learning communication skills, isn't it? Of course. And the media rules everything now, isn't it? Whether it's social media, media or um or the mainstream media and now we have more of a voice you know uh, because we don't have to go through the mainstream all the time we have our own platforms although although that might be taken away from us as well at some point but yeah so we, we should all have social media skills as citizen journalists and it's just about packaging telling a story in terms where people can relate to it people can um you know it resonates with people keep it short and sweet concise English, you know, put the most shocking thing at the beginning, give the context at the end, all these little tricks that you can use to reach audiences and ultimately influence people, both Muslims and non-Muslims. So it was something, it would be, it's not the most lucrative career. So if you want to be rich, you probably shouldn't go into journalism. Um, but if you want to have a, a great time, and have some influence. If you're a bit of a show off, like I am, like Dilly, my colleague definitely is, you know, if you're a bit of a show off and you, you like the attention and you know, you kind of, uh, if you got the gift of the gab, you know, it might be, but as long as you can stay on the straight and narrow, you know, uh, don't get intoxicated by that so that you're losing your Islam and the fame and the likes and the shares. It intoxicates you so much that you think, oh, I've got to say something like really incendiary on Twitter or TikTok. And then I'm going to get this and you're looking at you and you're neglecting your family and we're all guilty of it, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think those communication skills are essential for a Muslim, whether they're going to work in journalism or not. Because we're all citizen journalists to some extent now, aren't we? 
Yeah. Yeah. Subhanallah. I was just going to mention, Mulana, uh, we spoke about this before you came. Uh, you know, you're, you've got your Twitter account and then you've got five pillars. Yes. And there's two faces there. Um, we're slowly merging the, the Twitter account onto today's <laughs> show because what we see on Twitter, Subhanallah, from yourself, yeah. is, is like, um, it's, you, you can never imagine that it's the same person. Why? Well, all right. It's, yeah. It's oh, the, right. all unfiltered. Uh, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> my, my personal Twitter account, yeah. which is much smaller than the, the five pillars account, uh, is, is basically me. You know, yeah. uh, whereas Five Pillars, it's not just me and Dilly. It's like we consider this organization to be, it belongs to our readers. It belongs to our donors. It doesn't just belong to us. So we will put stuff on Five Pillars that we don't agree with, you know, just because as long as it's within the red lines of, uh, you know, halal and haram, if we, if it's a different opinion to us, we will put it on there, even if we, you know, don't agree with it, because this site does not belong to us. It belongs to the Ummah. That's how we genuinely look at it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, moving on to the next one, Molana, is um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, um, especially with the, the recent uproar, um, you know, you're well aware of this as well, and it's been on the, uh, on the, on the feed of five pillars, um, the Quran burning in, in Sweden. Mm. Um, you've got uh, one group of people who will say, listen, brothers, forget it, just stay quiet and um, let them do it. They're kuffar, this is what they're going to do. And yeah. uh, some, uh, there's actually some people out there who say, it's your sins, it's because of you that we're going through this. Um, you know, uh, you need to fix up and then this will happen. You've got that category, then you've got those who just say, listen, stay quiet. And as you ex explained as well before, like the Christians where they just become so liberal that they, you know, they won't, they'll tolerate anything and everything. Yeah. Um, and then you've got other the people, mashallah, like yourself, who've voicing their opinions um, and, you know, condemning these acts. Um, you know, what, what, what's your, your view on this from I your think, experience? I think we have to be, I think we have, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, it, it's the same debate over the Lady of Heaven protest, right? Whether to protest or whether to ignore it. My position is if no one knows about it, if it's just some guy mouthing off in the corner and he's insulting the best of creation, he's insulting Allah Almighty or the Quran, ignore him because no one knows about it. But once it gets into the public arena in a big way, I think we, we are duty bound to say something. And that was my position of the Lady of Heaven protests is that it had been reported in the mainstream media. It was getting into the cinemas, you know, so it was reaching a mass audience. So could we really have our, our Prophet wasalam, insulted and traduced and not say anything? No, we have to tell the truth about who the best of creation was and introduce him to non-Muslims and et cetera, et cetera. You know, but yeah, so the, the Quran burning, it was done in a very public way. Um, it was all over the news, front page stories. So there was a protest in London. There was, hasn't been one in Birmingham yet, but there was a protest outside the Swedish embassy in London on Saturday which I went to. Uh, that was the first, in the Muslim world, there's been quite a lot of protests, but not much by British Muslims. Um, I personally think we should, I, you know what I think we should do? I think we should fund translations of the Quran into the Swedish language, mass produce them, go and hand them out to Swedish people on the streets of Stockholm, in the shopping malls, in the high street, wherever they are, that's our best response. No, mashallah. You know, and mashallah. through crowdfunding, and we have so many wealthy people in our communities, you know, they could just fund that like that. And I don't know, let's, a bunch of British Muslims, we could go across to, to Stockholm, give out free Qurans. I mean, you know, one second, Mullah, sorry, I'm cutting you off. Uh, you know, to add to what you said, um, like with the Lady of Heaven thing now, obviously Molana was involved in that as well, as in, you know, in, mashallah, um, voicing his concerns. Um, and obviously you you are also involved in that. My personal stance on that was I wasn't really for it in the right. beginning. Um, but then later on, obviously, I, I was behind uh, Molana and the other brothers who were part of it. Um, what what would you say was it was it, was the outcome result? I mean, let's be clear as well. Not every single um, protest that we do necessarily means that there has to be a positive outcome. Yeah, the, 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 that's with everything in you know in everything. Leave the end to result exactly to, to Allah mentality. to Allah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, what would you say, especially for those viewers? And there's probably a lot of people who are you know because you, you, we're interacting and on the daily basis we're always meeting new Muslims and in the communities as well. They come up to us, oh, no, 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 this happened. And they're doing this and all that. What would you say, um, in a nutshell, uh, was the, the summary end of result. Yeah, the end result of that? Of with, Lady of with six months of hindsight, I would say, I'm still happy we did it, uh, but there are negatives and positives. There are pros and cons. I think for the extreme uh, Shia who are behind this film, they were happy because they had their film publicized. So for them, it was kind of a win. 
But I also think for the Sunni Muslims, it was a win because it galvanized us, it united us. It was a cause we rallied behind and we need that unity. I think the biggest losers were probably the Shia who, um, the so-called moderate Shia, who kind of believe in the narrative, <laughs> but they want to stay quiet about it. They were the ones that were kind of the losers because they couldn't really criticize the narrative because it's their narrative. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they don't want to praise it, the film as well because they genuinely don't want to have an issue with the Sunnis. So that, with hindsight, is what I think. I mean, the, the film has got onto Amazon now. It's streaming on Amazon. Uh, it, 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 I mean, I didn't make too much... I did report that on Five Pillars, but I didn't make too much of a big deal out of it because I could see there was no appetite in the community for another Massive Lady of Heaven campaign. So I follow the community as well. You know, I'm a, I, I'm, as a news story, it'd be great if, like, you know, a Malana uh, Abbas came to me, let's do a protest and let's, like, let's all boycott Amazon and <laughs> stop our subscriptions. I would have loved it. And I'd say, yeah, let's, like, you know... <laughs> but I could see there was no appetite for it. So I've gone quiet about it as well. And as long as there's no appetite in the community, I'm not going to create an artificial storm. Yeah, no. Well, no, regarding obviously uh, a few uh, things. But I have, I have, and I, no, I haven't yet, but I will, um, as my own personal protest, I am going to cancel my Amazon subscription because it's outrageous that they are streaming this one. Okay, uh, like yeah. you mentioned, number one is obviously uh, the Quran burning into the. And the idea you gave us to get the Qurans uh, in Swedish translation mm. and to distribute them, alhamdulillah, fantastic idea. I think for us as Muslims as well, uh, Brother Roshan Mulana, as Muslims, this should be a wake up call for the likes of myself, yourself and the Muslim community as to how well versed are we when it comes to the Quran itself. Like, hey, it does affect us. The Quran is being burnt. The Quran is being disrespected. But how much of the Quran do we follow? Have we implemented in our lives? And how much of the Quran have we actually memorized? Alhamdulillah, we, mm. us Muslims, we have this, this huge claim. And, and the, the verse of uh, the 14 just comes to mind. Allah says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Allah says, indeed, we've revealed the dhikr, meaning the Quran, and we are going to protect this Quran. And subhanAllah, you see many, many people out there, alhamdulillah, they have memorized the Quran in the millions, and this is happening yeah. on an annual basis. So for this, I think, you know, as, as a moral and a lesson to take from this is, one is to go out there and counter it the way you mentioned, and one is for us Muslims to implement this Quran by reciting this Quran, affiliating ourselves with this Quran, memorizing this Quran, alhamdulillah, you know, and then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually use us as a means for protecting the Quran. Secondly, he mentioned with regards to uh, the pros and cons, and like I said, alhamdulillah, you know, your experience outweighs uh, my experience and Mulana's. But subhanAllah, I don't know if you recall, uh, I'm sure it was Sini World. Wallahu Akbar, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a, yeah. a, the karama of uh, myself here or the, the team of, of Birmingham or whoever else participated and the people in Bradford and Leeds. But Sini World actually, yeah. few months down the line, it become bankrupt. Now <laughs> I say, Subhanallah. I'm sure you've read this. Article. Allah Akbar. <laughs> yeah. So now, if you now if you connect the two, Subhanallah. Yeah. If you connect the two, yeah. You know, there's these individuals now. This uh, cinema decided. Now look, at the end of the day, there's means, there's asbab, and there's also the tawakkul as well. Yes. So Alhamdulillah, you know, uh, at times, like I said, there could be pros, there could be cons, and it's something you actually, you know, you'd enjoy being part of as well. Uh, My experience in life is this is my personal experience is that if you follow islam um the nitma will come to you from places you don't expect subhanallah and this is an example of that isn't it you know just that's all we have to do is do our five times prayer you know with khushu uh read the quran every day i mean my practice i mean i don't know you your viewers might find this uh, interesting because I'm not an alim like you, you guys, you know, and the brothers behind the camera, you're all studying Islam. But the majority, the awam, are not doing that. You know, they're just like me. They're just ordinary Muslims who might be doing other day jobs. What I try to do, what I'm saying is I'll never reach the level of ilm that you have. Okay, and, and, and ordinary people won't because we're, we're just not focused on it like you are. But what you can do is five minutes a day, one page of the Quran, read it in Arabic, read it in English, you know, just and... You, you do that. What is five minutes of your day? You're going to watch a football match, which lasts 90 minutes. You know, you're not going to miss that football match. Five minutes a day. You can't give that to the, the word of Allah. 
You know, the words of Allah. That's all you have to do. Five minutes a day, one page, Arabic and English, take in the meaning as well as the listening to the, the recitation. Um, and do that every day. And I, believe you me, if you do that every day, it won't be five minutes a day. It'll be 10 minutes. It'll be 15 minutes. It'll be 20 minutes. Brother, I, I have to cut you off day. Why? Because I remember the wise words of one of our teachers. And he said, your nafs, he says your nafs, your inner, uh, this desire we have, this nafs, this conscience we have inside us. He says, this is like a baby. And Alhamdulillah, this just adds weight to your point you just mm. mentioned. It won't remain five minutes. Mm. And he said, you've got to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to sit down today. I'm just going to read a line of the Quran. Yeah. Like you tell a child, you know, the way you, you, you speak to a child and you tell a child just a few minutes of your time or just a little bite and you give them one pea and then two peas for those children that like eating peas. But he says your nafs is like a child. So, and subhanAllah, like you sit down that child, you give that child and you tell, you tell your nafs, I'm going to read a, a, a few lines. And the Quran is a magni Allahu Akbar. Yeah. You know, the, the, the magnetic force in the recitation of the Quran, you know, only one who's actually recited the Quran can act truly comprehend the magnetic force within the Quran. It's not, I, did a, I did a prayer uh, course recently, how to pray. Now, I know how to pray. I've always known how to pray. But it's like praying with khushu. And I realize that for the vast majority of my life, I've not been praying properly. And I go to the masjids and I'm praying, you know, much better now, you know, slower. That's the biggest tip, slower. I'm focusing, even before I, you know, uh, say Allahu Akbar, I'm focusing on, you know, visualizing heaven and hell, you know, taking a minute to kind of really focus and prepare myself for prayer. Doing my wudu properly instead of rushing my wudu. You know, this is a meeting with your Lord. If we're going to go for an interview, you know, for a job, what would we do? We'd wear our best clothes. We'd prepare for it. Yet we, we meet our Lord five times a day with no preparation whatsoever, not even any kind of thought about what we're doing, no focus, you know. And I go to the masjids now and people pray so quickly. And I think, you haven't prayed. You, you, seriously, you cannot have prayed. I, I can't read into people's minds. But no way can that person next to me have prayed because he was praying like me a few years ago. Yeah. And he's like rattling through Surah Al-Fatiha. He's going into Sujood one second up again. And this is how the majority of people pray in our masjid. And this is a failure of our leaders and maybe uh, you guys, you know. You've got to teach. This is really simple things. Teach not just the, the words and the actions, but the meaning, the way we pray, our preparation for prayer. Um, this is something fundamental because this has transformed my life as well and my, my iman, you know, I, I enjoy prayer now. Before it was like, it was a chore to get through. And, um, I built it around everything else I was doing in my life. Now it's the other way around. I build the rest of my life around prayer and I enjoy my prayer. It's, 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 it's a lovely thing to do. Oh. Not all the time. Sometimes I, I pray badly as well, you know, um, but I, I've noticed a massive transformation in my prayer. And just imagine the the the, the ni'mah for the ummah if we could all just pray properly. <laughs> Subhanallah. You know what it is, Brother Roshan? You know what, what pleases us, mashallah, is that, you know, especially from your background and obviously whatever you're, uh, you've done, um, I mean, the main thing is that this is what we request from, you know, fr from the awam, um, those who are obviously probably more indulged in dunya compared to the deen. They, they do practice, but they're not fully focused or they're not studying it like ourselves or fully, um, you know, engaged inside the service of deen. Is that if, uh, and I think this is very important for our viewers to understand, is that um, if people like yourself, mashallah, if they um, do their da'wah in the form of just preserving the principles of our religion, mm. I think that will take us very far in life. I mean, you know, when we've got the author Duck stands like mentioning about the Quran, for example, burning of the Quran. You had in America as well, where um, there was that university lecturer yeah, who, showing for images of the Prophet, of yeah. the Prophet yeah. um, and where obviously you've come out and you've, uh, I think you wrote an article on that as well. Or? I haven't, but we can get on to that. Yeah. I, I can. I mean, I think what is what's important for our communities to understand is that they need to be ready to to present and preserve our religion, no matter what background or um, understanding they have. 
uh, in relation yes. to their deen. Of course, nobody's saying just be a jahil, ignorant and just come out and defend because you're going to end up doing more damage than benefit. But if you know and understand the religion, um, like we've, you had a video up on Five Pillars where um, that the brother Shaquille Afsar, I think he's, he's come out and he's, he's done a fantastic job. Yeah. Um, obviously, we don't uh, advocate for, for the swearing in that, in that video. <laughs> but, um, you know, he's come out and he stood up and um, there's about 30, 40 of them and they've just walked away. I mean, imagine if one you, guy, yeah, one yeah. guy, I mean, look, if, if we're principled in our lives yeah. and if this is what each and every person is doing within the communities, are you actually telling me that non-Muslims would, especially, let's put non-Muslims aside, the enemies of Islam would have the courage mm. to actually look towards us and say, listen, let's start messing around with these guys because none of them are ready. They're like chicken, you like sheep. You were talking about fear earlier on. I think you lose your fear when you read the Quran, you know, and when you, uh, you know, make dua after you pray. I think that for me personally, I mean, looking, if, if I'm, I mean, I have so many enemies. If I was, you know, whether the Zionists or the Hindutva or the British intelligence services, I have so many enemies. If I really thought about the potential, what these guys could do to me, you know, I wouldn't get out of bed. <laughs> but I, when I just focus on the words of Allah, I think I'm not scared anymore, you know, and they can do what they want to me. You know, Allah's going to take me one day anyway. And uh, what's the worst that can happen that I die, you know, and then shall I go to a better place? You know, it's like, yeah, that, that's how I, 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 I personally lose my own fear by literally reading the Quran, trying to digest its meaning um, and, and doing dua after I pray and just, just you know, <clears throat> bowing down to my Lord in complete submission. That's why I lose my fear. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Now, this takes us obviously uh, to the verses of the Quran again. Subhanallah, this is why, uh, you know, this a large portion of this podcast, Subhanallah, and the dawah has been coming from Brother Roshan, mashallah, you know, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I think it's a very heartwarming. Visiting Afghanistan. <laughs> very heartwarming, Alhamdulillah. Like, uh, it brings us to the verses, Aynama taqunu yudrikumul maut. Allah says in the Quran, doesn't matter where you are, death is coming to get you. That won't be delayed by a second. And we see many times when the munafiqun, Allah mentions the hypocrites, when they would try and avoid themselves from getting martyred or killed, rather, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah reminds them that, uh, you know, uh, that moat would come. Even in their houses, if death had been ordained for them, then death would have come to them. Regarding this fear factor as well, subhanAllah, uh, my question to yourself is, when did you break that barrier? When did you remove those shackles that them, you know, them, them uh, what do you call it, them chains that you were chained to, if that was the case uh, of fear, subhanAllah, and you come out and... I've always been quite a brave person. Great, just, okay. Um, so, that sounds so arrogant, doesn't it? But I think Allah has given me that, that courage. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the most, uh, you know, like... I'm not going to take on Mike Tyson or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, but but what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, I, I think I've got a moral courage uh, to take chances, and that's something that Allah's put in me. You know, Somehow. from uh, from childhood. Like even I, w I was brought up quite liberally. You know, I wasn't um, forced to go to madrasa or anything like that, and quite a liberal, secular even environment I was brought up in. Um, I had a wonderful mother. But my, my father was in Sri Lanka. My mother didn't bring me up with an Islamic education because she was uh, ignorant of it herself. But she was a perfect mother. Um, but, but Allah, even living in that environment in, 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 in North Wales, where there's hardly any Muslims around, Allah put that iman into my heart uh, from a very early age. Um, and just directed me towards, you know, like-minded people and uh, a Muslim community. So um, I, f I feel I've always been a bit of a troublemaker and always had uh, the courage of my uh, convictions. I made many mistakes along the way. I've done some stupid things which I'm not proud of. But yeah, I don't think I've really had that fear factor in my life. Well, and it brings us back to uh, the companions, Ali Muridwan. We see the Sahaba Ali Muridwan. Many of them, and Umar Radiyal is a prime example of this. Before the coming uh, to Islam, after coming to Islam, Subhanallah, after the turning point, uh, Ghalib and Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu mentions, he says, when Umar radiallahu anh entered into the deen, ma zilna a'izzatan mundhu aslama Umar. He says, Umar, now, subhanallah, you know, he was known for his, uh, uh, what, what can I say, for his uh, presence, mm. even before 
And subhanAllah, this presence, it had a positive effect in, uh, in Islam. So it just goes to show, alhamdulillah, each one of us, we have this potential within ourselves. And if we channel it the right way, like alhamdulillah, you did, uh, Allah guided you. And I, I constantly tell this from my few limited years in comparison to, you know, your years of, of journalism and your, your life experience. I constantly remind people time and time and time again, because subhanAllah, look, uh, I don't like about mentioning this, but, and I mentioned in a few podcasts, me and Mulana, actually, we were, we were mates. We've been mates for a long time. Alhamdulillah, we actually not chilled out together. You know, we would get up in the mornings, mm -hmm. we'll catch the college bus, we'd go to like boots, we'll put on the, the free aftershaves and get to college. And you know, subhanAllah, we did all of that. But Allahu Akbar, we didn't realize like I'm not saying, you know, I'm the most, uh, I'm Einstein or, you know, when we went to Madrasa and I was explaining to you before, we didn't have affiliation with the Urdu language, mm -hmm. but we didn't know that we had a potential inside us to the through the tawfiq and the, 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 the ability of Allah giving us that. When we went to Madrasa, subhanAllah, that potential, mm. alhamdulillah, we actually channeled that potential in the right way. Like before it was probably us doing other mad, mad stuff. Yeah. But once that was channeled, alhamdulillah, it opened up a lot of shackles for ourselves. So it just goes to show like from your, uh, you know, your, from your history, alhamdulillah, like I said, you had the experience in childhood. There was a potential inside you. And so the- That's in everybody. Yes, brother. And because- it just, I mean, I was not a great student, average student, uh, average intelligence, even now, like average, average at everything. But for some reason, Allah has put me in certain situations where I've been able to express myself and express whatever potential I have. And that's the same for every human being. You know, that's where you have to seek the right company and the right people around you so that you can, you know, realize your potential. Yeah, yeah I think let's move on to the next uh, important topic that's uh, Afghanistan, inshallah. Um, so Brother Roshan, in relation to Afghanistan, there's quite a few questions we've got. Um, <clears throat> when was the last recent um, time you went? Yeah. Uh, because I think, mashallah, you've been quite- Twice, frequent. twice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what would you say then? So, you know, from the 1990s when we had uh, Mullah Umar Rahimahullah um, in charge and then we had the whole system and the only thing that was going on uh, the Western media kept on um, mm. uh, you know banging the drums of uh, women's rights and education and now we've come along more than 20 years later the Taliban is in power again um, what's your thoughts on, on, on the government itself um, are they actually implementing Sharia um, what's your take on this inshallah yeah. if you can Spring. Yeah, so I went twice, uh, once for about a month uh, last November, and most recently, um, March, April, no, no, uh, November 2021, because we're in 2023 now, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, March, April last year, so over six months ago. And inshallah, I want to return uh, soon. I, I, I intend to go at least once a year, because obviously, you know, it's of great interest to our readers and the Ummah in general, because I guess it's first attempt to create a, a Sunni Islamic state that we've seen in a while, isn't it? So there's great interest because of that. And um, when I went there, all right, so uh, it was hard to get in at the beginning. Uh, I was one of the first British Muslims to go there, if not the first, um, after the, the fall of Kabul in August 2021. I was there about a month uh, after that. And um, I got in only because I was a journalist. I managed to get in through permission from the, the, the foreign ministry there. I went through Qatar. And then I flew from Qatar to Kabul on a, a plane which were only, only officials are on and humanitarian aid workers and a few journalists. And the, the, the journey from Doha to Kabul was amazing. You fly over southern Iran and western Afghanistan and it's all mountainous. And I was thinking to myself, no wonder they didn't find Osama bin Laden for so many years. <laughs> like, you, know, you wouldn't find a needle of a haystack in that place, you know? Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, so when I got there, it was like, Allahu Akbar, I wanted to kiss the ground. And, you know, it was like, I was amazing because I thought I'm privileged, honored to be here, you know? And you saw the, uh, the Islamic Emirate flags, the white flags with the Shahada on it. Um, and I met my, uh, my fixers because obviously they speak, uh, Dari and Pashtu there. Um, Dari is like a, a dialect of uh, Farsi. And, um, so I was a bit lost with the language. Uh, although later I found out that a lot of the uh, Taliban guys speak Arabic as a second language. So I communicated with them in Arabic because my Arabic is pretty good. 
not fluent, but pretty good. And, uh, and English as well. Some of them, believe it or not, uh, speak really good English. Mm. And, um, yeah, so I spent about a month there the first time and three weeks there the second time. So what would I say? I would say that, all right, pros and cons. I always look at it from pros and cons. Alhamdulillah, the, the occupiers, the Americans, the British have been kicked out. They defeated the, the powers of Tahut, basically, mm. you know, the superpowers of Tahut. And they did it by spending 20 years in the mountains in freezing conditions, fighting with, you know, rudimentary weapons compared to the high-tech weapons of the Crusaders. And for that alone, I must admit, I have respect for them. When the whole Ummah abandoned them, the whole Ummah did not lift a finger for the freedom fighters in Afghanistan. They did it on, on their own. That's why they don't listen to us. Exactly. That's why they have no, I'm not saying they don't have any respect, but when we tell them about women's rights, even Muslims, they're not, who the heck are you? When you freezing our you know what's off, you in your big house with your fireplace, you know, in your Mercedes doing your cryptocurrency, you know, and <laughs> we're pushing the right that's buttons. Their on Russia, attitude. <laughs> that's their attitude. Yeah. And I haven't got anything to say that. That's why I never lecture them, you know? And, um, so Alhamdulillah, Afghanistan is independent. It's ruled by Afghans now, not by foreign occupiers. They are making an attempt. They love Islam. They have that, that hub for Islam in their hearts okay. that you don't see when you go to many countries, many Muslim countries. When I go to the Khalij or even many Muslim countries around the world, it's very secular, even Turkey. Of course, there are individuals that love Islam, but I'm talking about generally as a society. Yeah. The Taliban, they love Islam. Some would say maybe too much because they're doing some uh, strange things. <laughs> but you can't doubt their sincerity in terms of they, they only care about Allah and His Prophet. And that alone for me is something amazing. You know, negative side, the country's an economic basket case. No country is recognizing it. Sanctions galore. The Americans have stolen all the money. Um, people are trying to leave in droves because of the economic... Even, you know, m Muslims who want to live there and build an Islamic state, how can they when they can't feed their families, you know? So they're looking to emigrate. And this is the reality. Um, what else? This security. This is, a, this is a pro. Before, there were hundreds, thousands of people dying every day. You know, because it was a war going on. Now you can go from, I went to Kandahar. I went to Jalalabad. I traveled all over different parts of the country, around the Kabul area. Peace and security. There are checkpoints uh, because we know that uh, Daesh are trying to upset the situation. And But I traveled freely. Uh, I, I walked in the markets on my own, you know, uh, with my guide and on my own, no security whatsoever. Uh, perhaps the first foreigner to do that Un, uh, 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 you know, until after the fall of Kabul. What else? So on the women's issue, obviously, I wouldn't have said that was negative until a few months ago. And now I, I fall into the category of that's a negative development. Um, because I believe that women have a right to an education and they have within Islamic boundaries and they have a, a right to uh, work as well within Islamic boundaries. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is the position of the vast majority of ulama around the world, even Hanafi ulama, Deobandis, whatever, you know, the, you know, because the, the, the Taliban are Deobandi Hanafi, right? So even within that madhab and, you know, that kind of thinking, it's still, that, you know, Mufi Taki Asmani, that's what he said, all right? So the Taliban seem to follow a minority position. Their position is that, you know, part of Hanafi fiqh is the, the Urf, the local customs. Their local customs are Pashtun Wali, you know, the local customs in the Pashtun areas. Women don't go out of the home. They don't work. No need to educate them. So, so the women themselves, do you know, so so put, put aside the... the the Western um, impressions that the, the locals have got from the 20 year occupation. If you, if you just look at the women themselves, um, obviously you mentioned about Kandahar when we were talking privately, um, what, what's the, the, the voice and the opinion of the women themselves? Um, are they for it, against it? Um, no, uh, I mean, first of all, in Kabul, 
you do you see women everywhere, even now, and some of them are barely uh, observing hijab. Although I think that might have changed in the last few months because the the Taliban were going quite soft uh, because they realized that. Before they just govern southern Afghanistan, everyone thinks like them. But now you're going to go to more liberal cities like yeah. Kabul and Mazar Sharif and Herat, um, where a lot of people don't like the Taliban, or a lot of them are secular. Some of them are atheists, they're communists, atheists, you know? So is it a wise thing to do to impose <coughs> Sharia on them from one day to the next, or do we have this education period, which could last, boy, it lasts for a year now that they're, <laughs> they're cracking down on it. Um, and so I, I did talk to women in Kabul. I interviewed women. Um, a lot of them off camera, didn't want to go on camera. A lot of men didn't want to go on camera because Kabul is essentially an anti-Taliban city yeah. and uh, a liberal. A lot of, I've got to say this openly, a lot of, there are a lot of traitors in Kabul who basically benefited directly from the American occupation through jobs. They work for the Americans. They sustain the occupation because it's like, if there weren't Muslim collaborators in Palestine, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, then the occupiers would not be able to run these countries mm -hmm. and stay there so long, okay? And in Kabul, there were loads of people who collaborated with the Americans. And there are different degrees of collaboration. Now, from a Taliban point of view, they were like, okay, if you are directly implicated in killing our brothers and sisters, we are going to arrest you and... And probably behind the scenes, these guys got roughed up badly. That's what I think went on, although that's behind the scenes. Then there are middle level and low level collaborators. Some were just desperate for food. So they may have um, worked on, let's say, construction projects, building roads funded by the Americans. Okay. Now for the Taliban, that's collaboration. For my, in my book, that's collaboration as well. But it's probably a lower level of collaboration. And there are, there's a middle level of collaboration where they're literally translating for the, the occupiers, you know, and they're working in their administration. So the Taliban, now they, they are more lenient than me. If I was the Mir al I would say, no, 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 no. Amir no, no. Roshan, mashallah. <laughs> and thank, thank God for everybody that I'm not Amir al Because uh, no, my own family wouldn't vote for me to be Amir. <laughs> but... Um, but because I do such a bad job, but 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 the Taliban said, I don't even want to call them the Taliban now because they're the Islamic Emirate, yeah. uh, and that's how they refer to themselves. They um, they said that we forgive you. Uh, we're only not going to forgive you if you are implicated in the in the death of our brothers and sisters, and they forgave everyone else. General amnesty. Now I think that was a generous offer, given that so many people directly allowed these kuffar to occupy a Muslim land, to invade, occupy, death and destruction for 20 years. That is a massively good offer. And I met a lot of these people in ministries. They were working in the Taliban ministry, the, the, sorry, the Islamic Emirate ministries, uh, and they were having off-the-record conversations with me. And they would be criticizing the Taliban. And they were saying, we don't want an Islamic state. Um, now, getting back to the women's issue, I was in Kandahar where everyone supports the Taliban, you know, or most people anyway, support the Taliban. And they believe in the concept of an Islamic state. And I met hardcore, hardcore supporters of the Islamic Emirate who said, look, these are our leaders. We obey them. But if there's one thing we disagree with them about, it's the women's education. We have daughters. We love our daughters. We want the best for our daughters. We want them to be educated within Islamic framework, but we want them to be educated. So the only thing that I found where literally Islamic Emirate supporters were disagreeing with the leadership was that one issue. And the way I figure it is the leadership. If you go to Kandahar, you kind of understand their mentality. You don't see women there. You know, it's like North, Northern Pakistan. It's like for centuries, well before the Taliban, you know, women didn't work. They weren't educated. They were just mothers. And, you know, daughters and wives, that's, that's their role in life. Um, and this is the world that the Taliban leadership, you know, know. They don't know the outside world. And there are other uh, Islamic Emirate officials who are more worldly wise um, and who are more pragmatic. And they will eventually take over. As long as the Islamic Emirate survives, they will eventually take over. And I think the government will become more pragmatic and more, more open even to foreign Muslims. 
uh, and to the ideas of, because at the moment they just laugh at us and they, they, they don't laugh, but they're pol very polite people. I met so many lovely people, very polite. They'll listen to you, but ultimately they're not going to follow what, what you're saying because who are you? You live in the West and you're, you're, you're eating up the din dunya. That's your life, the dunya. Whereas we're actually, peace to be Allah here, you know? Sorry, Brother Roshan. Uh, what's your thoughts on Malala Yusuf Zai? Uh, who is he? Malala Yusuf Zai, the, uh, the, the girl that was shot in Afghanistan and she was bought over here. Yeah. Oh, you said, oh, yeah. said Malala? Malala. Malala, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to pronounce her probably. Malala. Yeah, Malala, yeah. Yeah, Malala. No, but don't worry. Gender identity, she could be Malala as well. That's <laughs> <laughs> fine. Look, I mean, I think Pakistan is a better um, uh, place to talk about that. I mean, obviously, she got shot in the head by the Pakistani Taliban, which is not the same thing as the Afghan yeah. Taliban. <laughs> and that's completely outrageous. I think her dad has a lot to answer for. Because her dad, as she was getting threats, you know, you know, some people, they're crazy in, in Pakistan, man. You know, you know, you're Pakistanis, right? You know, it's like law of the jungle out there sometimes. And she was going on TV criticizing the Pakistani Taliban and she was getting death threats. Her dad, and she was like a, like 11 year old, 12 year old at the time, right? And because she had a, that media personality about her, her dad, who was a communist, was allowing his own daughter to put herself in that position of danger. And what happens? She gets shot in the head, shot in the head. Her dad, that is child abuse. He should not be allowed to have children and take care of children. Any of us, we had a, if we have a daughter and we know she's in a position of danger, of we take them out of that position. Of, not only a daughter, a son, but our daughters even more because you know, they're our honor. Right. And so I've got, I've got a beef with her dad, you know, and she was just a kid at the time. Now, obviously since she's come over here, she's been used by the West. Okay, this, uh, is my, this is exactly my question. She has been exploited, hasn't she? Yeah, she's. I mean, but she's an adult now. She should yeah. know better, right? Okay. But she's she's been offered all these Nobel Peace Prizes, this these money, these massive platforms. It's probably gone to her head, you know. And um, so I don't want to destroy her as a past personality, but but obviously I don't agree with a lot of stuff she says. Um, but ultimately, she's being used by the like Greta Thunberg or whatever. <laughs> all these people they fixate on these people and they create, they amplify their voices, and they could be nobodies. Majid Nawaz, for example, he was a nobody, but because he was saying things that they liked, they gave him this platform, they gave him the microphone, they gave him the money, and suddenly he became a very powerful powerful figure. And then when he went against COVID, the, the, the uh, received wisdom on COVID, now he's nobody again, you know? <laughs> so they build these people up and they're just using them like they're using Malala. Now they hear Andrew Tate. Now that makes me really suspicious. Now we all know Andrew, you know, you know, yeah, Andrew, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone knows Andrew Tate. All right. We know that he has done some dodgy things in the past, you know, porno business, webcams. This is all in the open. We know that, but he's a Muslim now that's behind him. Okay. And He's a new Muslim. Give him a chance. 100%. And you can't change overnight. You know, literally, I know I did a book. I co contributed to a book recently on Muslim converts. Many of them, and these are really good people now. Much Sorry, better Russia, we could just share the name of that book, possibly. Yeah, it's called Journey to Truth. By uh, it's, it's not actually out yet. Okay. Um, it's by a Qatari publisher. I did a bit of freelance work. Journey to Truth, published by Qatara Publishing House. It'll be available on Amazon in about a week's time. And a lot of um, these Muslims, they were, they were eating pork and drinking alcohol three or four years into their Islam. It, and and no, none of them became angels overnight. And they still struggle with it, but it's a process. And we have to give Andrew Tate the, because he could be a powerful tool for the Ummah. 100%. If we can, he's the most Google man on earth. He has a huge platform. Like whatever, I, I could do, I could do, Everything on five for the rest of my life, I wouldn't have as much, like him just going into the court with holding a Quran had probably more effect than anything I've ever done in my life, you know, mm -hmm. cumulatively, because of his platform. If he can be guided to the right path, he could be such a weapon for the Ummah. But obviously we need him to, you know, repent for his past sins and we need him to, uh, but some of our sisters especially and our brothers who are basically become radical feminists, you know, and have imbibed all this uh, soft Western feminism, they're trying to crucify the guy. And he's two minutes, he's a Muslim. Yeah. You know, that's not from Islam. Do they care what Islam has to say about this? You know, we have to give the brother a chance. And obviously, if he's guilty of criminality, 
he should serve his time in prison, you know? But it makes me suspicious when I see the mainstream media attack this guy in unison, like this massive campaign. It's been massive, hasn't it? Yes, huge. Demonizing him. Yeah. That makes me think there must be something good about him. Because this is the same mainstream media that beat the drums for a war in Iraq, that demonizes Muslims every day. Why are they going, why are they hunting in packs after Andrew Tate? I think it's because he's dangerous for them because he goes against the LGBT agenda. He promotes Muslim masculinity. And let's face it, a lot of us, we're not even, we're hardly men. You know, like we think if we go to the gym and have big muscles and have a beach body, that's what we think is Rajula. Yeah. That's not Rajula. <laughs> that's like fake Rajula. You know what I mean? That, but that is our conception of being a man now or it's being a drug dealer, or it's being, being able to fight in the streets and mug people. But, you know, look at the Sahaba. I mean, they're fighting so battles when they're 11 years old. So, it just takes me to a hadith, subhanAllah. Upon occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu was in the company of the companions, Ali Muridwan. And uh, he asked the companions uh, to the nearest effect regarding a powerful man. Mm. And the Sahaba were like, the powerful man, like you just mentioned, is one that wrestles the other to the ground. Mm. And the Prophet Sallallahu answered this and said, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِسُرْعَةِ إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ Allah Akbar, he's actually defined a powerful man for us. He says a powerful man is not the one that wrestles another to the ground. Rather, a powerful man, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is the one who controls himself at the time of anger. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Like Imam Ali did. In, yeah. Um, yeah. Subhanallah. So, uh, yeah, just carry on with what you're saying. Yeah, and... Um, I don't know, maybe you can enlighten me on this one, but I see so many, even Muslim men, crying like girls. <laughs> and it's pathetic. I think it's pathetic. My, my sense of manhood. I mean, obviously, if a loved one dies, tears will flow. If you're reading the Quran, tears should flow. But I see Muslim men crying because um, their football team loses or because of um, some pathetic, you know, girly thing. And I think, where is their manhood? This is pathetic behavior. You know, be a man. Restrain your, let the women cry. Let the children cry. Be a man. Act like a man. Do not act like a wuss, you know? I, I, so that offends me. It offends my sense of manhood. The way our brothers, Muslim, grown Muslim men, can cry over anything these days. You know? Yeah, you know, Subhan tell, tell me that I'm right or wrong. Come Come on, on, you part of it. But even, the, no, no, even, no. even these men, that these girly men who who kind of it, they're so in touch with their their mental health and feelings that they're going to, to shrinks and psychiatrists instead of the Quran. Do you know what I mean? It just it just makes me think uh, we've lost that sense of Rajula. Where are the real men anymore? These can't these can't be people that are leading our community. They'll they'll wuss out at the first sign of trouble. And um and we've got, we've got too many of these men encouraging us to kind of, this whole mental health agenda, it's about the emasculation of men. You know, we're becoming like women. Women are becoming like men and men are becoming like women in our society. Allah Islam's Allah against Allah. that. There's so much, you know, like, Allah, Allah. there's so much to be, uh, I remember one of the commentaries of uh, the Hadith of Jibra'il, alayhi salatu wasalam, antalid al-amatu rabbataha. And one of the interpretations that was given there is that women are going to start behaving like men and men are going to start behaving like women. This is from the Ashratu Sa'a, from the signs of the final day. So, Mulan, if you just want to elaborate on Rujula. Yeah, I mean, uh, Roshan, Brother Roshan, I think, you know what it is? It's, it's, look, <clears throat> it's because of, I, I, I believe as well that, you know, there, we've been, you know, there's so many people like, Alhamdulillah, talking to you as well. You know, I was mentioning this to brothers as well. When I spoke to Brother Muslim, I felt like long last brother, because when we talk like this, when we talk amongst our circles, mm -hmm. we talk to people. Number one, I'm telling you on a personal level, this, the, whether I've spoken to scholars, whether I've spoken to, not all of them, as well some people get offended oh he's brushing you know painting the same brush with everyone not all that but you know when you talk to certain learned people and uh, within our communities you find our people are not ready for sharia they're not ready they're not ready for the true pristine teachings of our no. religion i'll be honest with you they just want that you know sugar coated more sugar coated than even your average donut that you get from you know crispy creams or crispy creams yeah and um, i'm not you know promoting them by the way but so what i'm saying is that um the the, the issue here is brother roshan is that it's the same feelings that I've got what, what you resonate with what you're saying is that um, the men have become like women and there's there's no there's no jazba there's no yearning or zeal um, of being a man I mean I've mentioned this in, in my lectures as well you don't find a single companion of the Prophet who was not ready to die for the sake of Allah yeah 
you know, for, for an element of rujula, manhood, you've got to be ready to sacrifice something for the, the sake of Allah. If you can't do that, then you're, you're not a man. I mean, because look, if, if, if a man's not ready to defend his, uh, his, his woman, his wife, or his children, why is he going to do that naturally if he's a proper man? It's because he's ready to give something. He sees the dishonor, disrespect taking place. He's ready to give something for the sake of Allah uh, in defending his family members, his children. Every single companion, the natural state amongst them was that I'm ready to die for the sake of Allah. And each and every one of them was ready to be a martyr in the cause of Allah. If you look at our men now, there'll be a martyr for uh, a packet of crisps. There'll be a martyr for, uh, you know, coffee. There'll be a martyr for, you know, Brother Roshan being real with you now, yeah? Because this is Sotul Haq, as I mentioned yeah. before. They'll die for their masjid, you know, meaning mm. die, meaning that they'll, they'll, they'll stand up for the sake of their masjid, for their sheikh, yeah. for their peer, for their institute, for their organization. When it comes to Islam, meaning defending Islam against the onslaught of the non-Muslims, enemies of Islam, <laughs> you'll never find them. As... This is a problem we're, we're, we're seeing. And this is one of the objectives as well by inviting yourself is that we're trying to bring in, because when you, as you mentioned as well, it's, it's ironic that uh, you mentioned because Moza mentioned the same thing last week. He said, when you surround yourself and inf if you're influenced by, uh, by mice or by people who don't have bravery within them, then naturally that's going to have a knock and effect on you. You know, you mentioned about lions. If you're going to be crowded and surrounded by lions, yeah. then naturally you're going to behave like a lion. I think that's why two, uh, two points I'd make is that I think a lot of um, Muslims would find it really difficult in Afghanistan. Even if they wanted to go to a, a land ruled by Sharia, just, I mean, there's no nightlife there. You know, everyone goes to bed early and they get up early. So no shisha after dark and uh, yeah, no coffee shops, no shopping malls and just, uh, just your five times prayer and your work and your family. That's all it is really. Uh, so I think a lot of British Muslims would find it quite hard. But I realize, I've come to realize how soft we are as well. I'm not saying I'm, I'm hard guy or something like that, but I'll, I'll give you a funny, a funny story. Um, how can I tell this story without kind of revealing details about who these people are? Uh, I'll put this story in the past. And yeah, so I was, I was going to go somewhere and it was on, a, on an assignment. And it was last minute. It was like a war or something like that. And, and it was hard to get into this country. And I was like, this is a story that has to be covered. We need to get out there. We need to get out there. I don't care. Let's get on the plane. I know we've got no visa. I know we've got nowhere to stay. I know we've got, we don't know the, the local language. We've got no guides, but we need to be there. And my training as a journalist is you just go. And Allah will provide and whatever. And I realized my fellow camera people and whatever, they were like, no, I'm not going. Uh, like, we have to have a hotel booked and it has to be quite a nice hotel as well. And, and I was like, let's just sleep on the streets. We'll just sleep. Someone will provide, you know? And no, 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 no. Everything has to be... This is the kind of people that where where we are soft here. We are so soft, and I, as I say, you know, our the, the 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 conception of a man now is is someone who goes to a gym and trains and has big muscles. That's what we think a man is. I just want to elaborate on that point, and <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I've uh, mentioned this point in our podcast before. This takes me back to when I went on Hajj uh, on pilgrimage 2016. Uh, uh, for those of us who have been on Hajj, Mulana, I'm sure you have. When you get to Muzdalifah, and yes. I'm talking about Rujula, there's queues there. Yeah. And subhanAllah, I remember staying in Mina, and upon occasion there was an individual who, subhanAllah, he actually, while sleeping, he kind of wet himself. Mm. And this guy had no soap with him. He never had your detergent, or he never had your washing up powder. He had to physically go there, wash his clothes without any type of soap, mm. wash his body without any type of soap. The cleaning up in Mina, when you're going to Muzdalifah now, you know, before Fajr Salah, you're having to uh, line up 45 minutes. Before, I don't know how it is now, this was like probably seven, eight years ago. Mm. And I come back and I, and I shared these experiences regarding Hajj. And I was telling a few individuals, like today, like we, f we find an insect in the toilet. We find a little yeah. fly that comes into the Five toilet. Star oh, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and even at home, like seven yeah. stars. Right? And like when we come to, like when it comes to the toilet roll, we look for like the toilet roll with the most plies on there. You know, a nice, expensive Nikki's toilet roll, Mulana. You know, and I go when you get to places like Hajj and and, and, and certain places, you like you just mentioned that you had to go on uh, on your on your journalism to uh, to, uh, to a certain country. Things are tough. 
Yeah. You'll be faced with situations where there is no toilet paper. You'll be faced with situations where there is no pillows. You got to have this toughness about you. Now back to like Darul Ulooms. Now people don't know much about Darul Ulooms. Alhamdulillah, I've sat down with people from uh, from different fraternities as well, and when I've explained Darul Ulum, Darul Ulum it toughens you up. Mm. In you know, in within our curriculum in Darul Ulum, uh, in Dusbury and Mulana, I had this as well. Once a month, they would throw you into the kitchen. Once a month. And you'd go there, you'd wash all the meat, you'd wash the chicken, you'd, and then utensils, uh, Roshan, the, the, the tea, you know, the tea, uh, it's, like, it's like the size of a stove. Mm. And what we make tea, food, you're talking about 300, 400, 600 people. We had a murkas there. So you're preparing that tea, you're washing chicken there, you're washing pots there, you're mopping the floor there. Uh, toilets, we had the 40 bugs now. And there was a group of students who would actually, on Saturdays, there was 40 toilets and they would clean them. Mm. You know, they'd actually clean them. We had these, these side bugs now next to the dormitories we slept in. It was tough, bro. You know what I'm trying to say? It was tough. You had to go out there and do these things physically. And I believe, subhanAllah, what we're doing now as parents is, and this is a whole lengthy topic in itself, is we're just watching on our kids and society's made us that way. And we're just being bombarded left, right and center, which has brought us to this predicament. I strongly advise, one advice, and Mulana, if you want to carry on our brother Roshan, is getting that attachment with the masajid again. I think being detached from the masjid, like you said, when it comes to crying, like, don't get it, don't, don't get it, like, no, I say, don't get it twisted for the youngsters. But subhanAllah, when you're feeling like that, who do you turn to? Mm. It's Allah. It's Allah you turn to. Mm. And like I said, what is people think life's easy? Life is it easy. And I and my listeners now, when it comes to Juma talks now, when it comes to youngsters now, I have to tell them life is tough. I still remember, subhanAllah, the coach journey is I had to take. I got married while studying. My child was born, I, I, my newborn child, subhanAllah, this is not something I've mentioned publicly, but three, four months, I had to like leave that child behind to complete my studies. My coach journey from Dewsbury all the way to Birmingham, now, Allahu Akbar. It was an hour's journey from Dewsbury to Leeds at one hour I take on the bus, then an additional three and a half hours and I'd be exhausted. Mm -hmm. I was newly married, I'd be absolutely shattered and I would only have 24 hours at home and then I had to get back to studies. Mm -hmm. So life is tough, subhanAllah. You should come and this is why we sit with people of experience and I strongly encourage this all the time. I always encourage people to sit down with elders. Like my father, Alhamdulillah, he's 75 years old. When I sit in the presence of my father, mm. this is why we shouldn't take our parents for granted. Alhamdulillah, there's so much to learn. I've sat down with you mm. and subhanAllah, you know what? We've got to be I'm humble. 75, by the way. No, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Seven and a half. <laughs> so yeah, I'll just conclude on that point. Yeah, if was... there's anything you guys want to add. Uh, yeah, no, we'll... Uh... Uh, just a few more things inshallah and then we'll wrap up hopefully. Uh, because it's still uh, I think it's quite hot I think <laughs> the topic uh, we don't want to drift away inshallah you know in relation to Afghanistan um, what would you say um, in terms of uh, people going there from the UK um, they can uh, it's quite possible even when I went it was more difficult so I had to get a journalist visa but now I think you can even go to the uh, High Commission in London and you can get a visa and a tourist visa so okay. it's possible and you can fly via dubai so the second time i went i flew via dubai so they have direct flights from dubai to kabul uh you can go there on a holiday yeah and it's not everyone's uh first choice to holiday destination it's like <laughs> after benadorm and all that kind of stuff but yeah it's like um uh yeah uh i mean if you go it'll be completely secure and safe um, but you'd still probably need a guide, you know, uh, and there are plenty of guides. I mean, I can recommend guides to people if they really want to go. We'll go with Brother uh, Russian, inshallah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've always said that Brit British Muslims, they should, they should go there and see it for themselves. Brother Russian would be a mere meaning for us. <laughs> it, is, it is a beautiful Islamic society. It has huge problems, though, as well. Uh, and it's poor. It's a poor country. Lots of checkpoints uh, in Kabul itself for good reason. Um, but you'll find brothers that will help you there. And you'll have a great time. It's a beautiful, especially when you go outside of Kabul. And I took a, the, the ride to Jalalabad. You go through these like, mountains and it's just so beautiful. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing country, spectacular physically and diverse people. It's great for a holiday destination and it's secure. So I actually, no one's taken me up on this, but for the past year, I've been saying, 
people should go to Afghanistan for a holiday. And and if if people want to do that, then I know people that can meet them on the other end and take a group and show them the sites. So they'll 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 visit all the the the, the mosques, but they'll also go into the countryside, into the mountains, have great food, and just have a wonderful experience in an Islamic country. Well, just adding to that, we've got um, just obviously to strengthen your point. There's been a few vlogs now as well. We mm. get these famous YouTubers yes. actually going out. And they're vlogging in Afghanistan. There was this famous one. It was a, it was a black brother. I forgot his name now. He's quite famous on YouTube. I, I think he's called the Black Brother. Uh, he's just really? recently, he's a, and he's got a huge following on YouTube. I know Jay Palfrey went. Uh, yeah. He's a, a new convert. Okay. He wasn't too, uh, yeah, he didn't do a great job, but he went there. No, yeah. but the, this one, yeah. I, okay, you know, w w uh, this is very important as well for our viewers. I know because you mentioned before as well uh, about the negative aspect, and I think this needs to be... Um, sure. Uh, uh, highlighted as well is that as Muslims living in Britain, should we even be even looking at them with the negative light, especially with the women's education or looking down upon them saying these guys are backwards? What should our stance be uh, in your view of defending? The, should we defend the Islamic Emirates? Or I think even, I think given what they've, I mean, literally their defeat of the Americans and the occupiers historically even non-Muslims, they will put that beside the victory of the Viet Cong against the Americans. Yeah. That's how historically significant it was. So what have we done in comparison to that? We, we've done nothing. Exactly. So, yeah, so on a, on a certain level, we have no right to judge whatsoever. On the other hand, there's no way you can support some of the stuff against women they've done in terms of, and this is leaving aside the way, I don't care what the West has to say, couldn't give two pence worth what the West has to say. I care what Muslims have to say. And Muslims on this issue that I respect are criticizing the Taliban over this. But you're right. On the one hand, we have no right to say anything. Um, I mean, I, I have direct contacts with Taliban officials and I've not said anything to them. But if I interview them, I will ask them. Um, if I go again, I will definitely have to ask this question because it's the question on everyone's minds. Yeah. But do I feel inferior? Yes, I do. Uh, I Even the, the foot soldiers, because I wasn't just talking to officials, I was talking to foot soldiers. And these are very simple people, very young as well. You know, the, 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 the guys that did the fighting were like 16 to, let's say, 25 to 30. You know, that's, that's the Taliban. And then you have the elders who are, who are the leaders. Um, and I would spend hours talking to them and they were fascinated by this British Muslim coming and they would ask questions about our countries and, and not with like any jealousy because they genuinely don't want to leave. I mean, there are other Afghans who definitely want to leave, you know, but, but these are people that they're already in their, they're already in their perfect place and they're building an Islamic state. So they, they are where they want to be. And I felt inferior to them. I've never done jihad. You know, I've never... Uh, been in the heat of a battle. I've and a lot of them didn't have limbs. You know, they're missing hands and they're missing legs. I I would ask them about their families. They're all dead, killed in the war, killed in the the raids the Americans did, and it became so common these stories that would would amaze you that after a while I stopped asking because everyone has that story to tell. Smart. So, yeah, if you're asking, did I feel inferior to them? Massively inferior. Because I look at my life and the comfort of my life uh, compared to them and what I've done for Islam. And it's nothing. It's nothing. Yes, well, and, um, some, some, some people ask with regards to humanitarian aid, going there, assisting mm. them, assisting them from here. Uh, is there a possibility of some form of backlash? Can we help the Afghanis, especially after this? Uh, was it 90 billion or 90 million yes. which was seized by the Americans? Yes. So how can we go about Get aid. aiding, getting the aid to the Afghans? Uh, you can. Um, there are legitimate aid organizations working out there, even really big ones like, um, you know, Islamic Relief and Muslim Aid and, you know, the ones that work with the British government, you know, so it's all about board. Uh, I personally give to um, a local Afghan organization called the Kama Foundation. But, uh, you know, I, I would encourage anyone to check out 
Um, that's because I know them and I trust them. Okay. I've seen their work. Um, but if you're going to give anything to Af the Afghans, you should do your own research. Uh, but yes, that is obviously one way. Uh, and the need is huge, you know, especially during the winter months. Um, they don't have heating. They're living in shacks and they don't have heating. And it gets, it gets to minus 20 in Kabul, even in, you know, much colder than here. And uh, they have no heating and people are literally dying from uh, frostbite and hypothermia. And I'm talking thousands of people and man malnutrition. So the need is huge. So for me, it's like if I give any money, we all have our, um, this is something I should say as well. Can I, are we ending the podcast here? Can I just say yeah, this last thing? Go ahead. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I'm hungry. I'm not going to, yeah. um, I'm not going to translate that. Yeah. Just remember, Morano is always the first one to say about <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah. So. Um, when I give when I give money, I give to Palestine and to Afghanistan. That's my own personal choice. Others will be Pakistan and wherever, and it's all equally fine. Um, but what I think we need to do as an Ummah is have a mindset change when it comes to our giving, because we have lots of we're very generous, alhamdulillah, and we do have money to give. But what we need to do is get out of this mindset that we only give charity. What we have to do is. I, I, this is what I would recommend. I'd be interested in your thoughts because we need to build our communities as well. So we need to give our money not only to humanitarian causes, which are completely necessary, but often they're just a sticking plaster mm. because you give the food, you feed a family, you've got to feed them again the next day. Okay. We also have to build our strategic institutions like media, like think tanks, like, I don't know, uh, political institutions, etc. Uh, generally our institutions as well, to make the community stronger. So that, and, and what the work they do will com compound over time and will build a stronger community over time. Uh, media is just one example of that. Yeah. At the moment, we do not have a strong media, so we don't have a voice. We don't have strong think tanks, so we can't strategize into the future. Because we're giving all our money to to humanitarian causes. So we need to have that strategic thinking where we think short term as well as long term. And at the moment, all we're doing is firefighting and thinking short term. So 50% of your money to a strategic longer term cause, 50% to a humanitarian cause. When I give to humanitarian causes, I think about the long term, like water wells, because that, that you know, I, I won't give, you know, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, what was the most common donation from British Muslims was food packs. It's also the most ineffective donation mm -hmm. because, and why, why food packs? Because people wanted their name on the food packs and they wanted, um, they wanted the aid organization to film everything that was happening. And they could say, look what I've done for the Ummah. Mm -hmm. That food lasted one week. Okay. A water well, Okay, a water well transforms a whole community because children don't have to walk five miles to get water and fetch it. They can go to school instead and they get the skills to get a job. Women, it has, it has, it has a compound effect on the like, whole, like whole uh, community. In Mecca, Murana the Kaaba, and our water started off and they built a, yeah. the whole community. So, so as, a, as an Ummah, we are very short termists in our thinking. We're always responding to crises and firefighting. We need to get out of that mindset. We need to be on the front foot. We need to be strategizing, not one day into the future, one year, five years, 10 years. Where are we going to be in 20 years' time? At the moment, we're not doing that. Yeah, I think we'll just wrap you up there then, inshallah. And, uh, you know, I was going to ask you for your parting advice but I think Alhamdulillah mm. hit the nail on the head um, and like I, I think I'd want to add to that as well is that even when we look into the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we find that um, just in the aspect of media for example where, when the Kuffar of Quraysh after the Messenger of Allah migrated to Medina um, you had the onslaught of the Kuffar constantly disparaging the Messenger of Allah through poetry and through mm. uh, you know the verbal abuse was there and then the Messenger of Allah set up a pulpit for Hassan bin Thabit and he said to him Ajib uh, uh, 
give the answer back to them and fire back basically and he used to defend the honor of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i think the least thing that inshallah if we do this i i would believe that um if we just get one uh, person their mindset changes after this whole discussion that we had uh, in relation to media itself where they donate two five pillars because we strongly all of us sit in here uh, you know we strongly uh, agree to this fact that alhamdulillah at five pillars is doing a fantastic job um it's a voice for the voiceless it's helping the communities as well if just that one viewer inshallah we believe if he just changes that mindset and starts donating or assisting through um whatever means they have available i think this will help the ummah at large as well and many people don't seem to, they they they, they uh, tend to forget as well which i think i just want to mention this and then we'll wrap up as well is that they want to see that one step donated they want to see the effects of that donation there and then Mm -hmm. and many people i mean if i'm going to donate to five pillars it's gone and you know even though alhamdulillah you're using the 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 donations according to whatever is uh, you uh, a to the the best of your ability and your understanding but many people when they donate they just want to see that that food package there and you know with the name stuck yeah. but what they're not realizing is when they're donating towards the the media channels especially like five pillars and many other organizations that are uh, working for the truth and supporting the haq what they're not realizing is that um, maybe that one that five pound that they donated a video was made um, and he refuted many ideologies and and then through that subhanallah so many uh, muslims uh, mindset has changed many non muslims have started coming towards islam so inshallah this is uh, very important as well uh, again uh, brother roshan jazakumullah khaira on behalf of me and mola uh, abbas ab as well for taking out your time as well mashallah it was a very fruitful discussion and many of the viewers definitely must have benefited from this uh, jazakumullah khaira inshallah this is not your first and last hopefully we'll have more inshallah, discussions as well inshallah um, may allah subhanahu Subhanahu wa taala bless you in your health, wealth, and in your activities. Inshallah, Amen. may Allah Subhanahu wa taala keep this brotherhood amongst us uh, in the dunya and in the akhirah. Inshallah. Amen. Uh, to f till next time. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah.